Yu-Gi-Oh! is a franchise that, despite its overwhelming popularity, is often subject to unfair criticisms. In general, there's an unwillingness to take it seriously because it's just for kids, and thus, for many, any positive sentiment about the series is reduced entirely to nostalgia. While there's some truth to these claims, they don't justify writing off the series as a whole and undermining the feats it does accomplish. After all, a series can be an object of nostalgia while simultaneously achieving a certain level of quality. Think no farther than Cowboy Bebop or Princess Mononoke. Likewise, one could argue that the whole shonen demographic is just for kids, yet this so-called criticism fails to come up amid discussions of One Piece or Hunter x Hunter, two other manga that ran alongside Yu-Gi-Oh! and Weekly Shonen Jump. I suspect that this misconception is rooted in a common experience with the franchise. Most people have only been exposed to the 4Kids dub of the yu gi anime, a highly censored version of an already questionable adaptation. What's more, most people have only experienced the series as a child, a time in which one's interpretive faculties are the least developed. It's only natural, then, that for those whose only experience with the franchise is of a censored dub of a questionable adaptation at a time when their interpretive faculties are the least developed, that they struggle to entertain the idea that Yu-Gi-Oh! could actually be a well-written battle shonen. But that's precisely what it is. The original manga, written and illustrated by the late great Kazuki Takahashi, was serialized in Weekly Shonen Jump from September 14th, 1996 to March 8th, 2004. It ran for a total of 343 chapters, which were later compiled into 38 volumes. The English print, published by Viz Media, divides the manga into three subseries. The first, promptly titled Yu-Gi-Oh!, includes volumes 1 to 7 and chapters 1 to 59. This material covers what most fans would recognize as Season Zero, a series of largely standalone stories that focus on various games outside of just Duel Monsters. The second subseries, titled Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist, includes volumes 8 to 31 and chapters 60 to 278. This, for many, is Yu-Gi-Oh! proper, where the focus is almost entirely on Duel Monsters. Here, we find such iconic arcs as Duel's Kingdom and Battle City. The third and final subseries, Yu-Gi-Oh! Millennium World, includes volumes 32 to 38 and chapters 279 to 343. While the anime bases its final saga, Dawn of the Duel, on these chapters, it takes significant creative liberties in how it adapts this material, rendering the two arcs almost completely separate. With this breakdown in mind, I, following Viz's division of the manga, will speak to the strengths and weaknesses of each subseries before rendering a final judgement regarding the overall quality of the series. The first seven volumes take on a largely episodic structure. Each week, a new villain appears doing something villainous, Yugi challenges them to some sort of game, beats them, then saves the day. Generally, this sort of formula grows tired rather quickly, but that's not the case here. Takahashi's original intention was to write a manga about, quote, a weak and childish boy who becomes a hero when he plays games. In this way, the manga was Takahashi's means of exploring his love for games, using them as a vehicle through which an average Japanese schoolboy could mature and establish their own identity. To what extent he accomplishes this in the first part is questionable, but what is clear is how this love for games translates into each chapter, keeping readers engaged during the entirety of this first part. Each week, Takahashi creates a unique game for Yugi and Ko to participate in. The episodic structure works because each game is given an appropriate amount of screen time. No one game overstays its welcome, and if one game doesn't interest you, it'll be gone the following week. What's more is many of these early games have surprisingly high stakes. In Chapter 4, for example, an escaped prisoner holds Anzu at gunpoint. Yugi challenges said prisoner to a game wherein each participant may only move one finger, a seemingly simple and benign game, if you can call it that. The prisoner chooses his index finger so that he may pull the trigger on his gun, while Yugi chooses his thumb. The reason this is not clear until the next page. The prisoner has an unlit cigarette in his mouth. Yugi offers to light it for him, and as he reaches over the table, he places the lighter on the hand of the prisoner, which is pouring a glass of alcohol. The situation is thus. The prisoner can't fire the gun, as the recoil would knock the lighter into the alcohol, setting him aflame. This creates an opportunity for Yugi to escape with Anzu, leaving the prisoner to eventually drop the lighter, burning him to death. The beauty of this scene is twofold. For one, Takahashi has proven that every move in the manga is calculated. Earlier scenes of the prisoner drinking and smoking were not only to establish certain character traits, but calculated steps that would later be integrated into the game and conclusion of the story. 
This sort of situational awareness of one of Takahashi's greatest virtues, as it allows him to unify various seemingly arbitrary elements of a chapter into a cohesive ending. For another, this also demonstrates that Yu-Gi-Oh is not merely some manga about a children's card game with no stakes. Many of these games end in the death or near-death of a character, which Takahashi is not afraid to depict, unlike the anime counterpart. Despite my seemingly endless sea of praises for the first part of the manga, there are a couple of issues I would like to highlight, above all being the character writing. While some of the earlier dynamics are done with a great level of care, much of the characters are fairly stock. I'm willing to forgive this as Takahashi himself intended on creating a normal Japanese schoolboy at the start, which we will see later developed in subsequent parts, but as they exist in isolation here, apart from the rest of the story, they can come off as generic, especially to a more modern reader who's been overexposed to many of these archetypes. The other major issue, and one that will plague the series as a whole, is that Yugi constantly feels undefeatable. Again, this is not a problem in and of itself, rather it's only when these victories don't feel justified. And at least in part 1, Takahashi takes great care to come up with unique solutions to the games he creates, giving the reader the impression that Yugi genuinely had to think his way out of the game, and hence that his victory is deserved. This is not always the case, but I would like to think that in part 1, it's not as big of an issue as it will become. So overall, I give part 1 an 8 out of 10. It features a lot of great writing, is full of passion, and was a joy to read. Yu-Gi-Oh! Duels takes up the majority of the series, constituting almost two-thirds of the manga. It should come as no surprise then that it contains both the highest highs and lowest lows of the series. This section begins with the famous Duels Kingdom, spanning chapters 60 to 133. This is, for all intents and purposes, the pinnacle of Yu-Gi-Oh! as a battle shonen. To understand why, a brief summary is in order. Duel Monsters, the game, starts as a collaboration between Industrial Illusions, an American company headed by Pegasus, and Kaiba Corporation, a Japanese tech company headed by Kaiba. When Kaiba enters into a coma in Part 1, Pegasus plots to take over the company by going to the five biggest shareholders and convincing them to let him assume the role of CEO. The issue, however, is that the value of the company is largely contingent on Kaiba being the king of games. But since his defeat to Yugi, also in Part 1, their value has plummeted. As such, Pegasus suggests holding a tournament with the intention of defeating Yugi, making him, Pegasus, the new king of games. These Big Five would then accept him as their CEO, as it would allow them to restore their value as a company. While this context is laid out in the anime, the manga emphasizes it in a way that better structures the arc, giving all the actions within it more purpose. By contrast, the anime can often come across as a mere series of duels, with individual characters having their own motives, but no significant overarching meaning. The real virtue of Duel's Kingdom, however, is its approach to duel monsters. The game officially debuted in Chapter 9 of Part 1, where it took on a fairly primitive form. Using a variety of monster and spell cards, reduce your opponent's life points to zero. When the game returns in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist, it's largely under this same primitive guise, but now with even more cards and longer duels. What makes Duel's Kingdom great, however, is that unlike the real-life card game, with its standardized rules, the manga features a much more flexible rule set. The advantage of this is that Takahashi could focus on creating more unique card interactions that make duels both interesting and unpredictable. For instance, in Yugi's duel against Ryota, the Ocean Field spell gave Ryota's water-based monsters a huge advantage. However, Yugi, in a move that can only be described as pure genius, decides to attack not any one of Ryota's monsters, but the moon. As a result, the tide of the ocean drops, revealing and weakening Ryota's monsters, allowing Yugi to win. It's this kind of situational awareness that Takahashi excels at, taking otherwise mundane details from a chapter, like the location of a duel or the time of day it occurs, and incorporating that into a strategy for duelists to use. These unique card interactions introduce more nuance into the battles. Unlike the actual card game, where the outcome of a battle is determined by the monster with the higher attack value, the manga utilizes these unique interactions, which introduce the possibility of a weaker monster winning, with a bit of strategy. While such examples might seem like an ass pull from the perspective of a modern reader whose familiarity is limited to the real life card game, this flexibility is precisely what makes the earlier duels much more exciting. On the whole, I have very little to complain about with regards to Duel's Kingdom. Here we start to see some of the characters break away from the shackles of their earlier generic selves, and we're given a whole host of interesting duels, all packaged within this corporate political drama. It begins to foreshadow a lot of future developments, especially with respect to the ancient lore behind the game and how Yami Yugi is connected to it all, and overall, it's just a pleasure to read. However, it's not perfect. As previously mentioned, Yugi still feels unbeatable. While there are many instances in which his victories are well earned, here we start to see Takahashi employ the power of friendship trope at a much higher frequency than before. While this is not inherently bad, it becomes quite repetitive and can leave readers with a bad taste in their mouth, especially after seeing Jonoichi win his millionth duel through the power of friendship. 
Duel's Kingdom is then followed by a brief, albeit fun arc, Dungeon Dice Monsters, which covers chapters 134 to 145. While this arc has no real significance outside of introducing a new member of its cast, Ryuji, it's a nice detour for both Takahashi, who likely desired a break from drawing just duel monsters and wanted to farther explore his passion for all things gaming, and the reader, who likewise could use a palette cleanser from all the card games. The second major saga in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist is Battle City, which covers chapters 146 to 201, or 278 if you include the tournament finals. For many, this arc is paradigmatic of what Yu-Gi-Oh! is all about, and understandably so. It maintains a healthy balance of all the dueling fun from Duel's Kingdom, with the stakes of Part 1 and the Egyptian lore of Millennium World. Here we also start to see some major developments in the rules of the card game. Monsters over 4 stars require tributes, fusion monsters can't attack on the turn they were summoned, and so on. This brings the manga's card game more in line with the real-life card game, admittedly not by much. More importantly, however, it also helps mitigate a pressing issue for all battle shonen, namely power creep. You might recall that in Duel's Kingdom, players could summon their most powerful monsters for free. Dark Magician and Blue Eyes White Dragon, despite their enormous strength, required zero sacrifice. This was not a huge issue then, as the difference between the weakest and strongest monsters was not so great. And further, because of Takahashi's approach to the game, there was always the opportunity for a weaker monster to defeat a stronger one through some clever strategy. However, this is not the case in Battle City, where the difference between a god card and even the previous strongest monsters is monumental. Hence, Tribute Summoning presents such monsters with a much needed check in power. On the topic of duels in Battle City, something else must be said. Unlike Duel's Kingdom, where duels were largely settled by unique card interactions, Battle City attempts to situate most of its duels within the bounds of the established rule set. As a result, there is much more spell and trap card play than in Duel's Kingdom, but much less outside strategy. The difference between the two is perhaps best explained through a hypothetical example. In Duel's Kingdom, Yugi attacked the literal moon, but in Battle City, he would have activated a spell card that destroys the moon card. While the outcome is similar, the Duel's Kingdom style presents itself as a sort of outside the box or on the fly thinking. Yugi had to figure out that the moon was affecting the tide, giving Ryu an advantage, and that destroying the moon would reverse this effect, allowing him to win. Conversely, the Battle City style already tells Yugi that the moon is giving Ryu an advantage, and he has to hope that he can draw a card capable of destroying it. While he still has to come up with the idea himself, it often feels feels like he is simply lucky enough to draw the exact cards necessary to complete the combo. The reason I mention this difference in style is because of how it amplifies a previously established problem, that being Yugi's undefeatableness. Although Yugi is not literally undefeated, he has this presence of, I'm the protagonist so I will ultimately win at the end of the day. As previously mentioned, it's not inherently problematic if it feels like he earns the win, which in Duel's Kingdom he often did through his on-the-fly thinking. But now in Battle City, where luck plays a much larger role, some of his wins can feel less Justified. While the quality of dueling starts to taper in Battle City, a greater emphasis is placed on developing individual characters to new heights. Of particular significance is the dynamic between Yugi and Yami Yugi. While the two have coexisted in unity over the course of the story, Yami Yugi is slowly confronted with the reality of his past life, forcing Yugi to wrestle with his distinction and difference from Yami. Here we find the seeds of Takahashi's original intention starting to bloom. Yugi, as an average Japanese schoolboy, begins to wrestle with his identity as distinct from Yami's for the first time in a serious way. We won't see the resolution of this internal tension until the end of the series, but it's clear that the longer Yu-Gi-Oh goes on, the more of a character-based drama it becomes. There's so much more one could say about Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist, but to keep this video short, this should suffice. Overall, I give it a 9 out of 10. Yu-Gi-Oh! Millennium World is the part for which I have the least to say. As I've mentioned, the trajectory of the manga, especially post-Duel's Kingdom, is to focus less on the duels and more on developing individual characters, and in particular, Yugi with his relationship to Yami. That's not to say that the duels are somehow less important in Millennial World. After all, this arc is perhaps best understood as a history of duel monsters. But rather, it's clear that Takahashi's emphasis is now on finishing the character arc that he started all the way back in Part 1. Millennium World picks up with Yugi's identity crisis in Battle City and amplifies it tenfold by literally splitting Yugi and Yami apart forcing the two to grapple with who they are as an individual. Their journey to uncover the truth of Yami's past and where that journey takes them is handled with the same level of sophistication one would expect from Takahashi at this point. However, because this is the climax of the series, and a climax which differs in meaningful ways from the anime adaptation, I've opted to keep my remarks here practically non-existent. Instead, I hope that what I've set up until this point has convinced you to read the series, so that once you get here, you too will be able to understand what makes Yu-Gi-Oh special. Overall, I give Millennium World a 9 out of 10, and the franchise as a whole, a 9 out of 10. My name is Doofy, and thank you for watching.